What's up, streamers? It's Amitai doing a late night session. Um, I thought I'd do something a little different today because I've been doing something a little different in my open source work the last few weeks. Uh, I do a lot of package source. I've done a lot of package source on this channel. And um, something I rely on in package source, since it is itself portable to so many platforms, uh, and since I maintain so many packages, I really, um, I, I can commit when it seems to work on the platform that I'm currently building it on, which most often would be Mac OS, followed closely by NetBSD. But I feel better if I've checked on more platforms than that before I proceed. And um, that's one reason I have sort of a build farm. It's one machine. It's a Mac Mini that is uh, Intel-based, and it runs a couple dozen virtual box virtual machines. We're in one right now. You can see on the bottom of the screen here, uh, I'm in a Tmux, and I've got a lot of, I guess that's Windows or Panes, I forget in Tmux what that's called, uh, lots, more than I can you know, command A and type a number to. Um, and so this is good. I like that I have them. But every time I spin up a new virtual machine for package source, I haven't been trying to streamline or automate or share any configuration with the other virtual machines. I just kind of copy paste and go manually until I have <coughs> um, pseudo go and password lists so that so the builds are easy to unattend. Um, that I have uh, Etsy Keeper so that I can track the important changes to the system's Etsy uh, when I made things work so that I can easily steal them for future virtual machines or remember how I got this one to work. Um, and I certainly haven't done anything like script the bootstrap arguments that I'm always calling the bootstrap script with um, or factor out parts of the uh, the build configuration that should be true on every build that I do. Uh, some some parts will differ. Like um, most of the builds I do, the ABI would be a 64-bit ABI, but occasionally I do a 32, and so that can't go, you know, uh, unconditionally in the common file. But lots of stuff that I build with should probably be set equally but via an include uh, on every virtual machine that I have. And so I haven't been trying to boil the ocean, but I have been setting up a couple new virtual machines recently, uh, an Ubuntu 21 and uh, a Gen 2 Linux, um, just to try to stay up with what kids these days are doing. And, um, and as I was setting up the new ones, I tried to be a little more deliberate. Like, what are the steps that I'm doing? Is there anything low-hanging to automate about that? Um, and in any case, just write down what the steps are to make them more explicit. And that's, uh, that's kind of a pattern you can follow. You can uh, document the process that you already seem to have really cheaply. Just write down what it is that you are doing, that your brain tells you to do, and follow it. Uh, and then from there, you can sort of make multiple passes as you go and find the next thing that you wish was a little more automated. And so I've been doing that, and what we're watching here is that. This is the Gen 2 system that I just, I'm pretty far along in the, in the steps in my checklist. Let me show you that checklist. Maybe before I do that, let me get this build unstuck. I'm noticing something here that I wrote down. Uh, it seems like on Gen 2 you can see there's this missing runtime search paths check. This is a package source check schlibs. It's something that it sort of statically analyzes the built libraries of the generated binary package. And if you're a package developer, you turn on these checks. Uh, and if they don't pass, something fishy is probably going on. Or maybe the, the way that the libraries are being checked is not correct on a particular platform. Like on OpenBSD, I know it doesn't work very well. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing a lot of this with the system compiler, GCC on Gentoo. 
So I don't want to try to make sense of that right now. It's nothing particular to my packages that I'm responsible for. But I do want to take a note that I'm seeing a lot of it. Uh, and I did do that. So Gen 2, several packages. The first one I saw was N curses. Uh, seemed to fail the, the schlib checks. So let me just work around it by setting package developer no, which is a shorthand for lots of checks that happen at package time. I just want to get past that. Oh wait, that was that was more than I would have intended. There was a particular package in the stack that I wanted to do that to, but I don't really want to do it to all of them. So let's get back this way. That's fine. Uh, over here, IkiWiki is done. The, there are two really big packages that have lots of dependencies that are really good test beds for me. And IkiWiki is one of them, and um, the whole QMail server meta package is another. And when both of those are going pretty well on a platform, then most of the things that I would need on that platform, if I was going to run a server on it, are in good shape. And so it's kind of my own smoke test. And I was writing down these two, and then I had the idea, you know, there's lots of stuff I'm a maintainer for. It. Some of it's in the dependency chain for those two, and some of it is not. Some of it is just other stuff that I install or don't install sometimes. And we could see that over here in package source.se. You can see all the packages for which mons and npsd.org is the maintainer. It is a good long list. And so, like I said, a lot of these get installed automatically when I do a really big umbrella install, like Meta Packages QMail Server or WWWIKIWIKI, but not all of them. And um, the way that I'm using my build farm here, I want to be able to rely on it, like to go to every single one of the virtual machines and say package rolling replace, which is sort of the the um, the rolling upgrade. Take package source this week, see what's new since what I have installed, uh, sort it into some kind of a optimal order of which things to rebuild based on what needs rebuilding, uh, and go and do it. And then I want to do that about once a week and notice what breaks, if anything, for all the packages that I'm responsible for. And so um, I just wrote this line before starting this session with the stream because I realized like these, these are pretty representative. These are the things that I have been manually checking for. But as I try to streamline my environment, what am I really concerned with? I'm concerned with everything that I maintain. And sometimes I'm concerned with things that I don't maintain, but I'm concerned with everything that I maintain. And so what I would like to do at some point is automate this step, uh, do something like package rolling replace would do for an update, but for a, an install to go, you know, list all the packages that I'm maintainer for, including these two, they don't have to be special. They've just been special because I've been doing it manually, but include those in the entire list and then sort it in some kind of optimal order. Um, I don't want to like explicitly install each one that I'm the maintainer for, or maybe I do. Uh, but I would like to, you know, at least my first draft thought about this is it would be really cool to have some package tools sort this into the shortest list of highest level packages that bring in the rest and install those. Um, maybe I'm overthinking it. Maybe I should just go make sure manually that each one is installed because I am explicitly interested in the packages that I maintain it for. Um, but then I want to be able to have that on all my virtual machines with as much configuration shared as possible um, to make it easy when I spin up a new one, that there are very few manual steps and they're super well documented and as much of the steps that can be scripted are. Something else blew up here. Let's see what happened. I might have left with it. So let's see what I left over here. Yeah, another failed check in GMP. So let's just explicitly do that one that way. 
get on with it. So while these builds are continuing, again, like I said, this is a Gen 2 virtual machine, which, by the way, if you are... I'm really... I have mixed feelings about Gen 2. On the one hand, obviously, as a package source developer, I am very sympathetic to a build system that uh, is pretty source oriented. You can do binary packages with Gen 2, um, but it's pretty oriented toward doing your own builds, and it's pretty oriented toward, um, like, there are default options that we try to choose wisely, so that for a lot of use cases you can take the defaults and get packages that work well. But also, lots of Unix software has optional features that you might want to add or you might want to remove. Uh, like one package option I know I want to get into my shared config. I don't run any kind of a Kerberos realm for my machines. Maybe someday I will, but at the present I don't. And various things in my dependency chain currently, because of the default options in them, bring in Heimdall or MIT Curb 5 or something like that, which is fine. But if I'm not using it, I'd like to not have it as long as I'm doing these source builds. Um, I'm not the maintainer for those things, so I don't I don't need to check those. Um, so um, Gen 2 has this also. It's really oriented towards source-based builds and um, making customizing your options sort of globally easy. I, I'm sympathetic to that. On the flip side, it's a whole operating system. Package source is a layer you put on top of any operating system. Uh, and Gen 2 is a Linux, which is okay, but I don't usually get excited about that. And um, the install process is really involved. Uh, by far, the most annoying setup for a virtual machine that I've done. So I'm happy I have it, but I wasn't happy to do it. I wouldn't be happy to do it again. Um, and that's part of the motivation for like at least everything else about my setup. Once I have any virtual machine, at least my setup, the package source installation and bootstrapping and getting my developer tools in place uh, and then getting the packages that I care about installed so that when I do updates, I exercise them. At least that part could be easy. Um, and so Gen 2 is one of the reasons that I'm working on streamlining. So as we wait for that, let me show you what I've come up with so far. This is a note. Um, so say I'm going to spin up a new machine, because I am. I'm going to I have an Ubuntu 21 that's like bleeding edge, but I also want to set up a long-term support Ubuntu 20 in addition to the 18 and 16 and 14 that I still have running, which maybe I don't need to. <laughs> I'll take your opinions gladly. Um, but so setting up an Ubuntu 20 sometime soon. I'm going to follow these steps for that. Um, Ubuntu will already have sudo installed, but it might not be passwordless. And as a package source builder, I'm always going to want it to be passwordless because we build as non-root into a staging directory, generate a binary package, and then if it needs to be installed for that, we become root. And I don't want to have to type in passwords um, and, or notice that I need to type in passwords. In, in the happy case, I can type make install on a really high level package and come back in a while and everything is done. That's the happy case. And so if, if sudo can be passwordless, then that's part of that. Uh, Etsy Keeper is something that tracks system configuration in Git. And I want that. Um, if the system has its own native package of Etsy Keeper, obviously this, that's the easiest way to get it. Uh, it's in package source. I'm the maintainer for the package source package. So worst case, I can wait until after I get package source bootstrap to start tracking the changes that I've made to the system configuration. But ideally, I, Etsy Keeper is one of the first things I install when I spin up a new virtual machine. Um, so that the defaults are the baseline. You know, whatever the system shipped with is the first commit. And then whatever I do to it after that, are my own commits, and I can track what I change. Um, it's not super important if I miss a few steps, but in general, I want my changes to be committed and to be trackable. So the sooner I can get Etsy Keeper, the better. 
Um, then uh, I mentioned there's a lot of virtual machines. There is one real machine hosting all of them. It's a Mac mini Intel, and uh, it's an NFS server to localhost where the virtual machines are connecting to it. And so for each virtual machine, it should be an NFS client mounting my source trees, one of which is package source. There are others. I have um, an IkiWiki source tree, an Ocumail source tree. I have uh, my dot files are in there. Um, my um, my Vim uh, modules, I guess is the word, bundles are in there so that I can use one copy of them across my machines. And, um, you know, lots of stuff is in there. So NFS mounted at a predictable path. Um, once NFS is mounted, I have a repo in my trees directory that is where all the system, all the virtual machines Etsy in Etsy Keeper should get pushed to. It's a single repo. Each virtual machine is a different branch. And that way, conceivably, I could relate, you know, like an Ubuntu 20 to an Ubuntu 21 and do a diff and see what's different about that. Typically, that's not what I need. But just to be able to have, you know, the configuration of any of these machines available to look at on any other one of these machines is easy. They don't need to be separate repos. They sort of belong together. Branching is cheap. Single repo. So once I have NFS, set up an origin and push to there. Now I'm ready to bootstrap package source. And I have a script that I just made for that. Let me show it to you. In fact, it's going to be in trees, package rebuild, bin, and it's called package source bootstrap. So I have a format I like to follow with my shell scripts in general. I always have a main. I always pass it, the arguments quoted in this way, and then I always exit explicitly with the return code of main, whatever it was, which is typically the exit code of the last command that I ran. Uh, so here's the main. Before I get into that, I also have set E, so if any error happens in any command along the way, the shell script will stop with an error there. I do that whenever I remember to. I, I wish I remembered every time. So all this does is it CDs into the well-known path where we have um, the package source checkout mounted from my trees and CD into the bootstrap subdirectory and run the bootstrap script that's in there with these particular commands, with these particular uh, arguments. The biggest one is prefix that says, where are the build packages gonna go? Uh, and other big ones are var base. Um, typically that would be var, but I like to isolate a little bit because of package source in case there's something by the same name provided by the system. Um, I like to put my var and var package and my etsy and etsy package. But sysconf base means something subtly different, and I do want that to be etsy. Uh, and then prefer package source yes is true by default on a lot of platforms, but I just want it to be true. Anywhere I bootstrap, it's fine with me for that to be true. I'm a package source developer. Uh, it's nice that package source can look for system versions of libraries to link with, and if they're satisfactory, that's great. Um, but I'm I'm happy to remove that variable from my my build system. Uh, I misunderstood what MK fragment was for in the last couple of days, and so this is my new understanding. I thought what MK fragment was going to do is at the end of the bootstrap when it generates sort of a make a configuration file for BSD make that it was going to in put like a, a one liner, put an include, a dot include, which is a BSD make directive to include this named file. It doesn't. It includes the contents of this file. And I don't want that. Uh, what I want is is my shared configuration automatically included in the generated config anytime I do a bootstrap. So this file is a one liner that contains dot include to the path of the thing that is the shared configuration. So it's a little confusing, but it's pretty easy if you look at the contents of this file to understand. And then what you end up with at the end of a bootstrap like this is an mk.conf that can be really short. Um, all it really does is guard against make in any other context, like doing an FBSD system build. It sets ABI to 64, it could be 32, um, and then includes the shared configuration. 
And I'm trying to put as much as I can into this shared configuration file. And this, this is the line that the MK fragment contains that was then inlined into here, leaving me the include that I wanted. Um, so of course I have to have this file available in a shared location too. So that's a completed bootstrap. Let's come back to what we're looking for here. I ran the bootstrap uh, as root. This is what we're talking about. So the generated mk.conf is going to have a reference to build the m-mk.shared.conf as a result of the mk fragment line. That file isn't there yet, but since NFS is mounted, now I can symlink it into there. And then it's ready by the time I run make. Uh, there's a couple other things that Bootstrap will put into mk.conf that are just the defaults and they're in the shared file. And for now, I'm manually removing those. Um, things like where are the package tools? Uh, where do you want your uh, man pages installed? Things like that. That's in my common file. It's just that it seems to be included also. So I have to manually remove that. If I had to install sudo from package source, this is a good time to make it passwordless because I'm about to do a lot of building. Let's take a pause here because I have a broken build. And uh, this was in GNU TLS. Push D into GNU TLS and make package developer equals no. Did I? I think I spelled that wrong. Developer equals no. Install clean. That's definitely wrong. And prop D. That's going to go into the thing that didn't quite pass the, the shared library check. Um, skip the shared library checks. Install it. Come back here. And then I can pick back up with what it was doing. Yeah. So, right. At this point, I have my package source tools installed. I have my Etsy tracked in Git. Um, I have sudo. I can become root without a password. We are ready to run make if it was in our path. So this is really system dependent. I guess it doesn't have to be. I could always put it in my user shell, but I try to put it in the system configuration whenever I can. It can be tracked in Etsy Keeper. That's one reason why. Um, and also because some of the things I'm doing as a regular user and some of the things I'm doing is root. And so I want it to ideally be in a place that applies to both. Um, another thing that's system dependent is whether or not the man command that looks for man pages will already find them because of the path or, you know, the man.conf configuration, or whether I have to set man path for it to be able to find these things. It seems really system dependent. And so I just have to futz around until I can see whether the man pages from, say, package info are being found. Um, another thing I like to do, uh, I haven't done it on this system yet. Again, I like to do this globally, at least for shells that support CD path. I really like to be able to say things like CD dub 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 wiki wiki, which is not relative to where I am here. That doesn't exist. Uh, but CD path could, could know that a place to look is in trees package or CVS. And it is relevant, uh, relative to there. And so if your CD path is set, you can do this from anywhere and have it put you here. Um, and I have that on my development, like my primary development machines. And I would like to have that consistently on my virtual machines that I use all the same tools on. I don't want to have to think, like, should I run developer tools to work on a package on this particular VM? Do I have them all here? I want it to all be the same environment on all of them. And so CD path is part of that. Uh, at this point, I'm ready to run a short little install process. I'll show you what that is. This, um, the, the problem here is that at the end of a bootstrap, you have a program called bmake. And that's not always the program that you type. Like if I'm on NetBSD where I didn't do a bootstrap of package source because you don't need to bootstrap on NetBSD at present, um, then I just type make. I use the system make, and that works. And my finger habits are make as a result of many years of package source on NetBSD. I just want to type make when I need to type make. I don't want to have to think about which one. 
And so I have a wrapper script in here. I think it's this one. Oh, right. No, it's called package source make, and then I install a sim link to it. So this is package source make. It works pretty well when you call it as make if it's earlier in your path than your other one. And here's how it works. It's got this sort of a sentinel file that it's going to look for, which is like the, the main, it's like the main infrastructure file of package source. Um, and it's in this path relative to the root of the package source checkout. So first we try to see if we have a bmake in the path. And if we seem to have one, and we can find that sentinel file that suggests we're in the package source tree somewhere, either two levels up from where we are, or one level up from where we are, or right where we are. In other words, at the top of the tree, or in a category, or in a particular package. Then we're in package source. And when, when we got here, somebody typed make, bmake is the make we should run with the arguments we were passed. Otherwise, just assume that there's like a user bin make, and that's what they would have gotten anyway, and run that one instead. And so this is a wrapper, and it lets me mindlessly type make, because I put this at the front of my path, and get the make that I should get. Uh, and there are other things in here too. So the way we get that is that we say this target, package source, and that puts a bunch of stuff in here. You can see those sim links. And the, the most important one is package source make goes to the one I just showed you, and make goes to package source make. And this is at the front of my path. So if I say type make here, that's the one that runs that one. Quick pause for this stuff again. So instead of GNU TLS, there's just so many, so many offenders here. GPG me. Get that done. And then get back to that. Right. Um, I don't care a ton on my development machines about whether the packages I have installed are vulnerable. So I don't worry about automating, fetching the vulnerabilities list from package source to do the check. But it is annoying if you have never done that fetch every time you do a build or an install you get a few more lines of warning that you have never done it and so just to shut that up it's really easy to run this command and in fact uh, that needs to be done as root um, then before i get to building any packages this is a, this is something that i'm starting to regularize as part of my new shared configuration that's coming out of this I have defined my own variable called build VM platform. Let me show you where I collect all these binary packages. They, they start to collect in here under the, the package source checkout in a packages directory. So far, so normal. And then this is where it diverges from the defaults for any package source checkout. I have subdirectories for each virtual machine that I have or maybe have ever had. I don't clean it out regularly. Um, and You'll notice the tuples here are sort of inconsistent. Uh, sometimes, for example, um, I have this Debian 9 Linux where sometimes it's about uh, this kernel version and sometimes it's about that kernel version. And I don't actually usually care about a kernel version. Occasionally there's a package that does. Hey, thanks. Uh, Solarized Dark, best theme ever. I tend to agree. Uh, in the daytime, I might use solarized light occasionally, but even then, pretty often dark. Thanks for thanks for pitching in. Um, it's also really easy to find implementations of it for Vim and whatever else would take over your terminal. And so maybe you know other other color schemes are nice too, but if you can't find them for all your tools, then it gets really confusing. Solarized dark is ubiquitous. You can get it for anything, and it's easy and it's good. So. Um, so I wanted to, as part of my refactoring of my build infrastructure, I wanted to regularize these names and not have to remember the format, not really have to know at all. Um, and so, for example, I have a couple new ones. 
Gen 2 is one. It says Gen 2 instead of Linux. It says 2.7 instead of whatever the kernel version is. And then uh, in addition to the system architecture, it includes the compiler. And I actually realized I want to include the compiler version also, like GCC what? Is it the system GCC or a package source GCC? Is it GCC 10 or 7 or what? Um, that should be part of what's baked into the, the tuple here. But it's better than it was. Like, oh yeah, Linux 5.10, ARM, yeah, sure. But that's just the kernel. The whole distribution is what's going to make those packages work or not. So, um, so I did it for Gen 2 in this automated way, and I did it for my Ubuntu 21 in this automated way. Let me show you what that looks like in our shared configuration. And then I'm going to go and sort of catch up all the rest of these in the course of time. So um, the shared configuration that does this is going to be Etsy package, build VM shared mk.com. So this is where I'm sort of building out the, the thing we're looking at is called build VM platform. So I can show you if I go into some typical package and say make show var, var name equals build VM platform. So that's how we get that tuple. Um, if I did it on my Mac, my host Mac, I don't think I hooked that up yet. Um, yeah, so it's not there yet, but it would say something like uh, Mac OS 12.1 x86 64 clang and that's pretty good that's that's the direction i want to head and i had to add a stanza here for gen 2 because it doesn't include lsb release which is why i assumed every linux has that linux standard base gen 2 seems not to and so it's also a really rolling release oriented so maybe not that meaningful to have a version but it does have one and so that's what I can get. And I just sort of set out, I delete everything between the word Gen 2 at the beginning of the line and a version number at the end of the line. And that's what makes it into, into the string. And other than that, I don't know how to compute a good name for that particular Linux. Uh, if it's Mac OS, I want to call it Mac OS. Otherwise, good old uname works to distinguish what a system is. Uh, NetBSD, OpenBSD, FreeBSD, Solaris, uh, Triblix, good old reliable. Um, but this is an important step, and that's why I have it sort of as a sanity check. I don't want to have to remember to say what it should be, and then, you know, like, what if I update the virtual machine? Then is it going to keep building packages into the directory that I explicitly wrote when I installed it? That doesn't seem great. It should make a new directory for the version that it is now automatically. Um, so the only thing I need to do is check it before I start building any packages and, and collecting them in the wrong place. Um, that's how I discovered that Gen 2 needed it. So I'm trying to make this all inclusive for every platform that I'd ever have so that build VM platform is defined. And then why does it matter? It's not a package source variable, it's just mine. Um, so why does it matter? It matters because uh, packages normally would be set to everything up until here. And I want to have my platform past it so that I, I use the variable. That's why it matters. Um, okay, on with the show. What else do we need to happen in this universe? Uh, one of the first things that I seem to need in order to, you know, you see I have several Tmux panes up here building I was building simultaneously earlier in the show. Um, to do that, you need some kind of rudimentary file-based locking so that if you have two different things that wind up having the same dependency, they don't step all over each other building that dependency at the same time. Uh, the, you know, an, an easy, decent thing to do in that case is to have one of them that loses the lock exit and say, couldn't get lock instead of, you know, stepping all over it. Uh, and so this is a really basic tool I can get to do that. And um, once I have that, then I can turn on a lot more settings. In fact, I, I figured out how to conditionalize this. 
earlier today, right here. So if I'm currently trying to build, excuse me, if I'm not currently trying to build the, uh, the file-based locking tool, then turn on package developer, turn on um, where to put the object files being connected to the host name. Um, do that thing I was talking about where if, you know, if the package, if a dependency is already being built, then we try once to take the lock and then we exit. Um, and then this one applies to package installs. If we're trying to do a package install and the package database is currently being worked on, we can just wait and try again for that one. Um, and if I am currently building this thing, then don't set package developer yes, and don't set any of the locking options because I don't have the locking tool installed yet, probably. Um, so I worked that up. Once I have the locking tool installed, then I want to get the package developer tools, which are not the same as this, but they're closely related. This is a setting that affects uh, package sources behavior at build and install time, like those shared library checks that I seem to keep failing on Gen 2. Um, these are a bunch of tools like um, package VI for editing source code from an extracted upstream tarball in a way that leaves a trail that I can then run MK patches to generate patches that package source will automatically apply uh, and lots of other tools. So this is a good one to get. And at the end of it, I'll have basic stuff that I'll probably need a lot of anyway. Um, this is me picking a knit, but uh, after the bootstrap, um, I, I like to use compressed man pages. I don't know why. It doesn't matter that much, but I just like to know that a package can do it. Uh, and Bootstrap doesn't care about that. Bootstrap just does what it needs to do to get your stuff installed. And so at the end of a Bootstrap, you will have some manual pages, regardless of your man Z setting, that are not compressed. And so I wrote a little program that finds them. Package source find uncompressed man pages. That's all of it. So looking up package man for files whose names don't end in .gz. Uh, and then for each of them, do kind of an, an inverse lookup in the package database. I've got a file path. Which package does it belong to? And then sort and uniqueify those and print that list out. Uh, and then, you know, the result of this script is as root passed to package admin saying, this is a package that next time you try to rebuild something, this is something that needs rebuilt. Um, and, you know, by the end of that, when it's installed, the, it'll, it'll rebuild in a, like a live package source where the settings do take effect and the man pages will be compressed. I noticed at the end of this earlier today, um, a little later on, because I've gotten through this one, that Dovecot's manual pages were not compressed. Package source was sort of opting out of compressing them, and I untangled why that was, um, and uh, and committed a fix so that it can be. Basically, uh, some of the Dovecot manual pages use a ROF command, ROF being um, uh, the text formatting processor that does manual pages, MDoc, uh, TROF, GROF, maybe you've heard of ROF is the language. And so uh, a few of the Dovecot manual pages were one-liners containing a single ROF command saying include the content of this other Dovecot manual page. In other words, they were sort of references to those manual pages by other names. And in Unix, we have a better way to do that. It's symbolic links. Um, so I updated the Dovecot package very minimally and was able to test it across this build farm on a bunch of platforms to make sure it was fine. Um, to look for Dovecot manual pages that consist of one line like this and remove them and replace them with a symlink and then let package sources manual page compression handle it from there. And it works fine. So I committed it. <laughs> and I never would have found it if I didn't have this script and this process that I was trying to automate. So again, I don't know how much that matters, but you know, if you're a user and you set the compressed manual page settings, you want it to take effect everywhere that it possibly can. So this is a way that I check that. And then uh, this is the command I would run to uh, 
to rebuild anything that needs rebuilding, like I just said in the previous command, uh, and then to rebuild anything that depends on that in case it's sort of a library dependency. Probably there's no API or ABI change, but there could be. In my normal use, day to day, I do this, which also checks against uh, checks what's installed against what's in my current package source tree, which might be newer, and also adds that to the list of things to consider update. Um, got another little blow up here. Let's get in there, and where it says GPG me, I want to say, I see you. Get me out of there. Pretty tedious. Probably I should just turn off package developer for now. But I guess I sort of want to know how prevalent this is, even though I sort of do at this point. So uh, we're almost uh, done walking through what I have so far. This line here is about tools that help me as a developer personally that maybe aren't general purpose enough to say that everybody should have if you're a package developer. So I like, um, you may have noticed uh, our path names here have CVS in them, at least in my checkouts, because they're checked out from CVS. And um, you can get package source from a Git mirror, and if you're not a developer, that's just fine. And if you are a developer, that can also be useful because Git does a lot of things for you informationally that CVS struggles to. Um, but the repository of record is CVS. And so I want to make sure that I have a way, you know, Git does really nice divs. CVS is old. And so at the very least, I can take a CVS diff output and pass it through a program called color diff and get a git looking diff that my eyes are more useful to, or more used to, accustomed to. Uh, and then these are some other things I also like. The Silver Searcher is um, AKA AG, AG, is really fast at searching source code, like package source. Uh, my repos is really handy when you have lots of things to, you know, lots of repositories to update, I often do. Um, for example, for Vim, when I have all those bundles checked out, this can just sort of loop over all of them and update all of them. This is CVS, as we mentioned. This is how I get it installed. Uh, maybe the system has Git, but I would like to use the package source version. Here's that package roll and replace command that I probably needed to install before I did <laughs> this. So let's see what I can do about that. I guess this could just go there. That's fine. Um, <laughs> I always like to have the DJBDNS tools to look things up. CVSPS is another tool for coping with CVS. It sort of stitches change sets um, heuristically from commit times, log messages, committers. Um, you know, if because CVS doesn't have recent versions of CVS do, but arbitrary versions of CVS don't have. Um, what's the word? Um, atomic commits. They just commit a file at a time in rapid succession. And so if your heuristic is reasonable, you can you can have fuzz of, I don't know, a second or two uh, across all the files that should have been committed as part of the same commit. And it does its best to show you change sets. That's what the CVSPS, uh, CVS uh, patch sets is what it means, change sets. I like to install a very recent version of Vim just because it's a thing that I can do. Uh, watch is a handy tool. Mozilla root certs, open SSL, uh, gets the root certificates for your, um, for your SSL setup for package source and then installs them and puts them in place. And then just a handful of shells, uh, an open BSD corn shell, uh, MKSH, which is actually provided by package source already on some platforms as part of the bootstrap and links for a text-based browser. Uh, and if I have those, you know, I can do everything that my finger habits need to do. Um, then I should run package roll and replace. And now, you know, I have a running system. I have its configuration managed. Uh, I have package source bootstrapped and sort of uh, regularized, normalized, ready to go. I have the packages starting to accumulate, the binary packages in addition to the installed ones. The binary packages starting to accumulate in a directory that is well named finally. Um, and now I should go a little nuts and see how many packages I can build and see which ones don't.
And this is like this is where it starts to pay off for me as a maintainer, is to see what works and what doesn't for the stuff that I care about. So that's where we are, and we're almost here with QMail Server. So let's let's knock it out. This is our spam D. Kind of a more modern replacement for spam assassin. Yep, and we are. Whoop! What? Okay, I have a job to do here. Package maintainer alert. I didn't expect this. Um, I'm surprised to see here, what I thought I was doing is, I think we're just about done with our, let's, let's look at our dependency chain. SID is the same as show install depends. We have almost all of them installed. You can see from the left hand side, uh, we need a dovecot pigeonhole with this kind of a number matching, and there is one. We need, uh, is there anything with a particular? Yeah, we need a Python that's at least 3.9 or 3.9.0. We have one. The only thing we don't have is an rc.d-boot, no matching version. And I am really surprised to see it says it doesn't work on this platform which took me a second to understand how that could be true. I wrote that package. That rc.d-boot package is mine. What it does is um, again, package source runs is ecumenical. It runs on a zillion different operating systems, many of which have, you know, a wide variety of, of boot sequences and boot processes and uh, like service managers, all this kind of stuff. Um, I am personally, and package source is widely used by people who are accustomed to NetBSD style rc.d scripts, which FreeBSD is a close cousin of OpenBSD, is sort of a re-implementation with a similar design. Um, OpenRC is uh, substantially similar for other systems. Uh, and I, th I thought, yeah, let me come back to that in a second. So different systems, package source tries to support everything. Different systems have different boot processes, boot sequences. Um, and if you're installing services like, you know, like a mail server from package source on whatever system you got, your intention, probably assuming that you wanted to turn it on and turned it on, is that when the system boots, those services come up. And package source can't afford, I don't think, to write one kind of boot script per package per system. Uh, we have managed to write two different kinds of boot scripts for a lot of packages. In addition to NetBSD style rc.d, uh, a lot of popular packages have Solaris style SMF manifests. Um, but that's just because uh, Joyent and SmartOS are such strong supporters of package source. They've invested in that. In general, we can't invest in, you know, like identical or near identical boot scripts that are near copies of each other, but expressed in different ways for every package, for every system. So rc.d-boot is my attempt to sort of stitch things together in a practical way. It's that um, we can just keep shipping rc.d scripts for everything that we already have. And that's fine and sufficient in almost every use case if we have one script per type of boot system for integrating and then running all the rc.d scripts from there. Like, uh, for example, say it's system D. In system D, uh, if we had one system D item, that could then iterate over all the package source provided rc.d scripts and start them. It's not beautiful, but when the system boots, package source services would start. And we didn't need to write a systemd item for every package source service. We needed to write it for one that knows how to iterate and sequence the rest. Um, if you think about a boot sequence as a at least in time, a linear process, like this starts, this starts, this starts, this starts. It could be parallelized, but there is in some sense a flattening of the tree that you see on your screen of which things started in which order. This essentially adds a second dimension 
that, you know, one of the boot items or something that looks like one boot item for Ubuntu winds up being, you know, as many package source things as you turned on in that direction. And then the sequence continues to go down. Um, so I wrote this. Long story short, I wrote rc.d.boot and I made implementations of it for NetBSD rc.d. Um, let's look at what I did. I don't even remember. Let's check it out. So this is something I'm going to have to work on because I th I assumed that it was going to integrate fine on Gentoo, and this, I just discovered it doesn't. So here is what it looks like. It was last updated two years ago, just about. As it says, runs run package rc.d scripts at boot on any supported OS. So let's see. Yeah, rc. We have to figure out what kind of boot style we're dealing with, and then to see if we have support for that style. So let's see. Where can we discover what that style is? Right. First things first. If we're on a Mac, and we can see that there's a library launch demons, then we're looking at launch control. Launch control, Carl. As Homer Simpson would say. And so we'll call it Darwin Launch D. Launch D is what the what the daemon is called. Um, and so we're going to install something uh, to um, to this location. So opt package examples, uh, share examples, rcw boot. This thing, which is in Launch D format, and then we're going to. And install time, copy it over to library launch demons, yada, 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 where the Mac will find it and do stuff. Uh, stuff being run all the package rc.d scripts that, are, that have been installed. So that's that. Then FreeBSD, is it FreeBSD with an etsyrc.d? Then it's pretty native. We can use the rc.d scripts as they are. Uh, or if it's Linux and it has systemd entrails, then it's Linux systemd. We have a systemd service. We install it to here, and then we copy it over to here where systemd will find it. Or if it's Linux and it has sort of a system5 in it, then that's what we're looking at. And we'll have a script that goes there and gets copied into etsy init.d with some permissions. Or if it's Linux and it has this kind of stuff, then we think we're looking at sort of a Debian variety of system5 in it. And we'll install it here. We'll copy it here. That looks pretty, pretty extremely similar, actually, in this case. Uh, for our NetBSD, NetBSD native. For an OpenBSD, close. It's going to be similar, but not quite the same. Otherwise, yeah. nope. And <laughs> me two years ago knew that we didn't have this working yet. Okay, so that's what I got to do. I'm going to have to add a stanza. I'm not doing this tonight because it's almost my bedtime, but I'm going to have to add a stanza for uh, Linux and whatever the hallmarks of OpenRC are. L let me just show you what the integration looks like on a Mac so you can see what I'm aimed at here. Pretty sure I have it installed on the host box. So um, what you would do if you were on a NetBSD machine, you would edit... etsy rc.conf etsy rc and the, the rc scripts that you have that you don't want to start at boot you'd say no and the ones that you do want to start at boot you say yes so we have just that one so if i'm going to take a gamble on this demo if i have this running the way i think i do then i should be able to find some qmail processes running i don't okay uh let's see why not do i have I do. Uh, is it in here? I think I have to do list. Probably look for package source in there. Oh, it doesn't appear to be loaded. Okay. How would it have been loaded? There's um, a post install script. It works with this rc. Yeah, so it should have done this. 
So I don't know why I seem to be needing to do this manually, but let's see if it helps when I do. Is that file there? It is. <laughs> uh, do I have email installed in such a way that it could do that? Would it start if I did this? Oh, okay. It doesn't have the config files that it needs. That's probably it. Um, why not? I don't know. But let's do it this way. Let's pick something less complicated than Qmail, because I don't seem to have that configured right now. Mm, DNS cache. Do I have that around? Okay. Let's call that yes. And the config will be in, excuse me, here. Yeah, that looks like a good config. It'll run on localhost. So if I were to do this manually, that would actually start. And this is a normal RC. What? Hey, this demo is terrible. I hope you get your money back. Um, so what I'm trying and failing to demonstrate is that in NetBSD and in package stores, at not boot time, just like the system is up already, this is how you would start things manually. You would make sure that the thing is set to yes, if you intend for it to stay on after a reboot, and then you start it however you would start it, like so. Um, on NetBSD, because this is integrated into the boot sequence, you're done. FreeBSD 2, and OpenBSD almost. Um, on other platforms, you have to do something so that that system's boot sequence knows to start the thing that you're looking at. Uh, and that's what rc.e-boot claims to do. I have just shown you a really terrible demo because I didn't really care whether stuff is running on the system. I'm pretty sure it does still work on a Mac. I guess I could try it on my local Mac. That should be exciting then. So, um... Do I have an rc.t.boot here? I do. Um, do I have stuff turned oops, stuff turned to yes here? I do. And the real kicker will be like if Qmail is already running. I haven't started it since I rebooted. It is. Uh, at least the Qmail Q read is. The others look like they're supposed to be, but they stopped. Could be because I'm hacking on the code here. Um, but that's good. Like, Qmail read didn't start itself. The system started it. And something is wrong with my particular service. So again, not a great demo. But uh, but this can work. It has worked. And when I pay attention to it, it seems like it works. Maybe next time I should check before I demo. Um, but this is the idea. We have We have one package whose job it is to be the single integration point between all of package sources, RC scripts, and whatever the local convention is. And this is it. So like Darwin Launch D, you copy that thing into Library Launch Demons, you load it. And here's what it looks like. This is how you can see what it should do. Um, let's look at it. Library Launch Demons Org Package Source Yada. Not much to it. Most of this is the XML that you have to say. And then um, it runs this command with a start keyword. And that is it. So what is that command? It's a main function that says run all rc.d scripts, either start or stop. rc.d scripts uh, loops over the ones that it was given and gets these scripts and looks for this i think this is copied logic from netbsd's boot stuff and then this is the magic it runs rc dot rc order excluding things that say they shouldn't be started at boot time on the list of scripts that are installed and then if we're supposed to stop then we reverse that order 
and then we would iterate over the list either way, doing the start or stop to them individually. And that's it. That's how it would work on a Mac. Uh, and that program gets called a slightly different way from a system D item on a Linux or from uh, an init.d script on a, on a system five init and so on. So that's going to be my job. My job is going to be integrate this into um, integrate the Gen 2 OpenRC into rc.d-boot. And, um, and then QMail server will install. And whenever we bring up Gen 2, my services from package source will be as up as I wanted them to be without having to learn anything about Gen 2's boot sequence. Uh, me as the maintainer, I have to learn it one time to write this integration one time. And then all my packages never have to learn anything. And the users of my packages never have to learn anything. That's a goal. There's enough to learn. We're going to learn enough stuff. So let's keep it contained. So I think I'm going to stop here. Um, I may, maybe my next stream will be following these steps from scratch with, uh, with an Ubuntu 20 fresh install. That could be fun to do and then see what we can streamline as we go. Uh, but for now, that's the story. This was uh, sort of a, a view into my package source build environment, which is pretty thorough compared to what you need to get started with it. To get started with it, you don't need this. You just need to, uh, you, you could even do without pa a package source checkout. You can just get binary packages if you're using a popular platform and install them. Um, as a developer, it's a hobby for me. I like to be doing the builds. I like to check the cause and effect of any changes that I'm making on as wide a platform base as I can. And so that's what I'm doing. You don't need this. When I started, I didn't have this. It's grown over time because of my involvement. And you may never have an environment this complex. And if you don't, that's probably good. Not everybody needs this kind of a hobby, but it's mine. And I hope it's fun to watch. And maybe next time we'll look into what it's like to spin up a new VM with these instructions that I'm gradually automating and streamlining. So again, I'm Amitai. Thanks for watching the stream. This has been about package source and see you next time.